very interesting and significant that the the person in the Torah who was most deceitful, most sly, devious, and always cooked up a storm, meaning like some people are just calm, tranquil, sweet, peaceful. You walk around them and you just feel peace. And then there's these people, you walk around them and you just feel like, whoa, like, you know, like you're hit by a ton of bricks, like everything's intense. Can I just say, it's so wonderful. I think you can describe yourself. I'm intense? No, I'm just saying, first part. Yes, what I'm saying. Thank you. So, when you think about like a color and you ascribe a color to it, the color, which color would you ascribe with storms and, and, and you know, inner turmoil? Red, 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 black, black, black maybe, black. right? But what's the total opposite? What's tranquility, peace, calmness? Which color would that be? White. Blue also, right? But that's really just, um, it's really white. So if you see white, you feel oh, calm. On Shabbos, you put on a white tablecloth, right? On Yom Kippur, when, when the shul's dressed in white, there's a certain feeling of, of serenity out there. It would be euphemistic to call a person who's tempestuous white. That's the wrong name. The one man in the Torah who is, I think, more than anything else, he's not, he's not, you know, unlike Asaph, who's a murderer, Yishmael had his issues. Lavan is just associated with one thing. Ramai. He is deceitful. Like, he can't stay calm. That is what he's about. When, when Yaakov looks at him and he says, he, he tells him, Batachalefet maskurti aseret monim. Assuming Manez, hundred, a seret monim is a thousand, assuming that the deals which Yaakov and Laban were cutting between them took place in the six years, the last six years, because for seven and seven he was working for Rachel and Leah. So then the last six years, six years is about 72 months, 75 months, somewhere around there, right? If you switch the deal, well, let's say six times 365 is about somewhere around the 2000 mark, of days, if you have a thousand deals in two thousand days, what that means is that every two days you're flipping the deal. So imagine you go work for someone. You ever been like? Imagine you go work for a boss, and the boss gives you a system of operation. What you want to do is you want to know what time we come into work. What we do at work, how this operates, you want to know what the day is like, and here's what they expected of me, and here's what I'm going to do. Now I can fit into my lane and do my thing, and I feel successful. Imagine the boss comes to you every two days. He changes the time of work, what time you want to come in. He changes the location. He changes your position at work. What you're meant to do every two days, what would you feel like? When he walks in, you'd be like, Whew. And yet the Torah, which is... Torah is hora'a, it's instruction, it's real, it's in life, it's truth. Torah tells you that this man was given a name. Now, a name is a prophecy. Okay, I don't know when the soul gave love on his name, you know, soul wasn't such a tzaddik, but enough of a man to warrant that his daughter was Rivka and his granddaughters were, you know, Rachel and Leah and all the Shvatim came out of them, so they must have had something going on. And the Torah chooses to name him Lavan. So the Torah is saying, you want peace, calmness, hang out with Laban. Who every two days flips things on you. Who says, you, you know, you tell him in Hebrew when you want to say crystal clear, you say, Berachel bitcha haktana. Which is what Yaakov made a deal with Laban. And what did Laban do? He switched her. Gave him Leia instead of Rachel. Everything was, 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 Stormy, tempestuous, 
was the opposite of calmness. Why do you call this man calm? White. Beauty. The reason is, because if you're calm, when it's calm, then you're not really calm. You're only calm because there's nothing to get excited about. You want to know what really calm is? When you're in the middle of the tension and you're calm. If you can learn how to walk right into it, not run away from it, and be calm, now you're calm. And the Torah is sending you a message here that Lavan himself had tremendous potential. Lavan signified oneness, had a sense of being connected. And the problem was that he couldn't express himself in this world. He was so calm that he was insane. Who was able to draw it out of him? When Yaakov meets Esav, he tells him, Im Lavan Garti, I lived with Lavan, that's where I was. And as Rashi points out, I kept the 613 mitzvahs. Yaakov was able to draw out of Lavan the calmness and the whiteness. And when we pay attention to how Yaakov deals with Lavan, with this wily uncle of his, we discover how to be serene, peaceful, calm in the middle of the tension, in the eye of the storm. So let's jump into it to see what Yaakov did. Because understanding how Yaakov does it is how we can do it. Because otherwise you'll say, if your life is calm, okay, then you have no, no issues. But if my life is stormy, tempestuous, that's when I need to learn how to do Lavan. And what's beautiful is that the color white is not really white. White is made, one of the experiments that we did growing up, that I really remember, that was worth going to school just for that experiment, was when they took all the colors of the rainbow, Roig Biv. Right? So, all the colors of the rainbow, <laughs> and you, we put them like in a, on, a, on a paper, and we drew, we drew them, each color, and it was like each color was segmented, and then we cut it out and made into a circle on a cardboard, and then you paint it on both sides, so it had red, orange, right, all the colors. And then you put a, a string through the middle and you, you sent it going fast. It was like circling at, a, at high speed. And what happens is, all the colors turn to white. And you discover this fascinating nature that Hashem created. The color white is not actually white. It's actually the sum total of all the colors. The real colors, the rainbow, signifies the seven core colors. If you look deep into the seven core colors, what you will discover is white. What is white, it's not serenity on its own. White is the serenity that's come, that comes from being able to reach every single one of the colors, because the colors are an analogy for your emotions. Each color is a different emotion. That's why there's seven of them. Seven primary colors, there's seven primary emotions. All the colors together, what do they signify? White. Because if you know how to be how to be able to control, jump from one to the next, to the other, to the back and forth, and you're able to center yourself, you become white, tranquil. How do you do it? Well, Yaakov Avinu, when he is sent on a mission to Lavan, the first thing he did was he went into Yeshiva for 14 years. His mother and father sent him, go find a Sheva. He like got, you know, a little bit, um, a little bit uh, sidetracked. And he went to learn 14 years. Then he's like, okay, I gotta go out. So he goes. He arrives all the way in Aram. And then he's like, whoa, one second. I passed by the place where my father had the Akeda, Mount Moria, and I didn't daven over there. Turns around, it's like, I gotta go daven. He realizes that in order for him to face Lavan Ha'arami, this lion thief, he has to go back and get ready and prepare himself. So he heads back. Goes back over there. And there he davens. We speak about Yaakov sleeping and the ladder that he saw, what he was doing, 
was davening, because Vayifga en priya el atfila. He was davening the tfila, the prayer was Mayrev, the evening prayer. So he gets into a zone with Hashem. And what he does there, does there is very, very significant in us understanding. He takes all the stones and he makes all the stones into one stone. He slept in that place, took all the stones and made them into one stone. The Bat Ayn, um, who everyone was talking about lately because he's your attorney this week. So I was at a place that someone showed me, a, you know, we were talking about him. So he said, let's learn a piece of him together. And we opened up a piece. Said, no, there it said. It said that Vayishkav Bamakomahu, he slept in that place. Yishkav, he says, Yesh Kafbet. Yesh is there is, Kafbet is 22. So what does it mean? So he says there's 22 letters of the alphabet. When Hashem created the world, he took the 22 letters and they are the molecules of creation. Effectively, what God did is he set the world into being. He used the 22 letters as the molecular structure of the world. Now, what that does is everything in the world has a name. And that's the letters which Hashem terms it with. As a result, you become a yesh. That means there is. You start, you get an ego. You stop witnessing and beholding and feeling Hashem's presence. And so you feel your own sense of self and your own ego. And he says, the goal is to be able to, well, he says, Vayachalom means he dreamt, but Vayachalom means to add a cholam. Cholam is a vowel, right? The vav with a dot and chop, that's cholam. So he added the vowels, the, the, the hidden letters is what he added in. And what it means over here is that Yaakov, what he does is he says, okay, I'm looking at the world and I'm seeing mumble jumble. I'm feeling all detached and disconnected. And I feel like there's so much going on. And what I want to do is take everything and make it into one stone. Strange thing to do, isn't it? Yaakov goes to sleep and he's worried about being attacked by wild animals. So what does he do? He took the stones, which all became one stone, right? And where did he put it? He protected his head. If you're worried about wild animals, um, you think they can't attack your feet? What does that mean? He protected his head from the wild animals. Protecting your head is not going to be of any use if you don't protect the rest of the body. You know why Yaakov was protecting the head? He wasn't worried, actually, about wild animals. He knew Hashem was protecting him. What he was concerned about was the animals in his head in his head. And so what he needed to do was change his perspective and get calm and centered in order to be able to deal with life. In life, we all encounter wild animals. You may have noticed them around. What you want to do is be able to center yourself. There's wild animals all around. You want to be able to take all the wild animals and to be able to realize your goals and your purpose, align yourself, center yourself, and then you can handle anything. That's what he did. What he does is he goes into a meditation. He davens. He wants to realize that God is behind everything that goes on. It is fascinating that in davening, right, the peak of davening, the place where you are, it says at the most revelation of the divine. When would you say is in davening, right? Davening is about your encounter with Hashem. If you introduce davening into your life in a real way, it's you encountering Hashem. What would you say is the peak of davening? Shema. Shema, that's right. Shema is that you see Hashem, and then you walk into the zone, you stand up, and you go into a quiet, silent space with Hashem. Strange, because what are you doing in that space? You're asking for everything you need. If you were in a space with the divine, you should be able to shed yourself of all the needs that you have and be able to just feel what Hashem needs. Instead, you're walking inside there and saying, God, I need this, I need that, I need that. So in the middle of davening, you're getting very, very um, excitable, right? Worried, actually. Because you think, I don't have money, I don't have health, whatever you don't have, God forbid, and I need this, I need the shidduch, I need that. And you're thinking about all the needs that you have. And you're telling me that's the highest revelation of Hashem. Indeed it is. You know why? 
what is going on in the space of Shemayin Esrei. What you're doing is, in that Amida, is you're standing and facing every single thing you need. And you're watching how Hashem takes care of all your needs. And you'll say, but he's not. I'm feeling so lacking. That's exactly what Davening is about. It's about you moving into all the tensions that you had and asking Hashem for help and realizing how he's already helping you. The more you notice how Hashem is helping you, the more Hashem helps you. It's fascinating because we don't, that's counterintuitive. You think that I have needs, I have problems. The goal, what you de- don't tell your problems, don't tell Hashem how great your problems are, tell your problems how great Hashem is. Look at your problems and say, this is really tough. And then start looking at all the things you have that are phenomenal. So you're asking Hashem to help you with this problem. You have to actually ask for it. It is so comforting. But you must ask. You have to look for everything you need and turn to Hashem and say, Hashem, here's my issue. I'm really struggling. Help me with this. And you spend time. And davening is a lot of peace that you can actually ask. Whatever you don't know about, Shema Koleinu. I need help just figuring out how to do this. Tachonen l'adam dat. Hashem, give me some dad, give me some intellect, give me some connection together. I have a kid and I need him to reconnect to you. So you think, Allow us to do teshuva. And every space of davening, you walk in and you're asking Hashem. And it's critical in davening to actually, halachically, to ask for what you need. And then you move right back into a space of Watching how Hashem is taking care of you. That's the end of each request. Baruch Ata Hashem. I'm making a bracha over this. That Hashem, I really want forgiveness. I'm feeling very guilty for what I did. I'm asking you to help me and get me forgiveness. Baruch Ata Hashem. Hanunah means I feel like you already gave it to me. And so davening is walking into the tension, asking, begging, then walking out. You must ask. You have to look at what you need and connect your needs to God. Because through asking, your needs get answered by Hashem. If you didn't ask, He might answer you anyway, but then you won't feel how it came from Hashem. Through asking, you get to feel that my needs are answered by Hashem. That's comforting. Yaakov goes into davening. He davened. He was asking Hashem. And then what does he do? He says that he went to sleep. So first of all, he takes all the stones and makes them into one. That means to be able to realize that all the things going on in your life are actually one. One thing going on. Hashem wants a connection with you. And the reason why there's issues is so that he could get a deeper connection with you because you start seeing, oh God, I really, really see you there. And the more you notice him, the more he gets connected to you. Yaakov goes to sleep and Rashi tells us something fascinating, transpired. He went to sleep and Hashem told him, tells him, Ha'aretz asher the land upon which you are sleeping. I'm going to give it to you and your, this, and your seed and your children. You'll spread all over. You'll break through all barriers. It's all yours. Rashi says, what Hashem did was, like, what's the point of telling him that this land is your land? Like what? This little piece of land you're sleeping on? The small little thing? So what? What did Hashem do, remember? He folded... The entire land of Israel went jup, 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 folded it up, brought it all under Yaakov. And he says, Yaakov, I'm hinting to you, Rashi points out, that everything, this entire land, is yours. Ramazlo, he was hinting to him, that's going to be easy to be conquered by his children, like the four cubits that a person is on. See how easy it is? You went to sleep. It's all yours. What's Rashi telling us? What's the point here? How's Rashi know it? Rashi's supposed to be a simple translation, right? Jacob goes to sleep. And you're telling me that he went to sleep. And Hashem told him the land, this land is all yours. And he's saying, it can't be just this land. What's the point? It must be the whole land of Israel was folded under him. And now he's got the whole thing. So I ask you a question. 
Rashi's translation is not commentary, right? The Gemara says this, but the Gemara can say whatever it wants. The Gemara says that he was telling him, right, that um, I'm gonna the, the conquest of your son, of your when your children are gonna conquer it, it's gonna be easy for you. Rashi's not saying that. Rashi's saying it's just he's hinting to him how easy it is. You don't have to do anything. In the Gemara, there's an, an action. You're going to have to go conquer it and do it, and it's going to be easy. Rashi's saying he's going to sleep, and Hashem's hinting the whole thing's under him. How does Rashi know it? Right? You know how Rashi knows it? In other words, when you're reading the Pasuk without Rashi, what would you say it means? Hashem tells him, the land you're sleeping on is all yours. What do you think it means? Which land? Do you think it means the land you're actually literally sleeping on? Or does it mean, like, the land which you're sleeping on, the whole land which you're sleeping on, one part of it, is all yours? Don't be so literal, right? He's telling him, you're sleeping here, the whole land is yours. The whole Eretz Yisrael is yours. Why not? You know why not? Because the Torah tells us, Ha'aretz asher ata shochev alia. Could have said, Ha'aretz azot. This land is yours. He's very, very clear. He's saying, the land upon which you are sleeping is yours. And herein lies a very powerful message. Rashi says he's telling him, the land you are sleeping on. So the extra use of the words in the Torah, the land you're sleeping on, means that you're sleeping on the whole land of Israel. Why? Because Hashem folded the whole land of Israel and put it under him. Why would Hashem do that? What does that mean? Like he's folding the land of Israel. I mean, I don't know what that means to fold land up. But Hashem folded it up and put it under him and said, go to sleep. Hashem sent Yaakov the most powerful message you could ever imagine. He's telling him, Yaakov, the whole land of Israel, you want to conquer the land of Israel? You don't need to. The whole land of Israel is yours. You only have to do one thing. One thing and one thing only. And what is that? Sleep. Go to sleep. And the land upon which you're sleeping is all yours. So what does that mean? Surrender. Now what? Surrender. Surrender. In other words? You ever tried going to sleep? When things are really tense? Right? It's like hard. We have sleeplessness when things are tough. What Hashem is telling him is a very powerful, intense message. He's saying, Yaakov, if you want to conquer the land of Israel, I'm telling you now, the land of Israel is yours. It is all yours. I'm going to fold it under you and give it right over to you. There's something you need to do. What do you have to do? is relax. Relax into the space that's yours. If you're able to relax, the whole thing will be yours. You know when you lose it? Yeah, when you lose it, that's right. <laughs> if you can relax, it's yours. <laughs> so Hashem's telling him, stay out of the way. I'm giving you the whole land of Israel. I'm going to fold it under you. And I'm going to tell you, it's all yours. Stop blocking the energy. And then it's yours. In the sense of Eretz Yisrael, you'll see how incredibly real this is. What's blocking us from the land of Israel today? Not the wild animals on the outside. We know there's wild animals on the outside, very wild animals all around us in the land of Israel. You know what's blocking us? There's a lot of wild animals on the inside. That's the problem. What do they mean on the inside? It means you just got to conquer your own fears and anxieties and stand in your power and be able to say what you want and say it like it is without stuttering. We've noted the point already before that Eretz Yisrael it's not like public relations. We always claim we lose the public relations battle. Of course you lose the public relations battle. Because if there's half the world wants you dead, what are you going to tell them? What's the marketing here? The message is what? 
you're going to market to them. So we, we literally, we, we, we're, we're literally, these Jews, we come up and we say, I'm going to market to you a message. The message is, look, look, they killed us. Look, and come see how they killed us. And come notice it. And they come in and they feel so bad for us and whatever. And then they publicize it. You know what they're saying deep down? They're saying, wow, those savages, they're real. They, they, they're really good. They're like, they don't care. We, most of us, are, not, are too civil to do that kind of thing. But that's so good. Look, they just killed them. That's what needs to be done. What do you think it means when you walk up with a sign that says free Palestine from the river to the sea? <laughs> Looks like an innocent sign. What, what are you saying? And I asked them, oh, you actually go, I'm not killing anyone. I'm not ready to kill. But that's what it means. Right? So just some are too civil to go do and what the others are ready to do. Where's the problem? Hashem protects you from all the wild animals. What you need to do is protect your head so that your head feels protected by Hashem. And when you feel protected by Hashem, you are protected by Hashem. Let's do a marketing stint on what we need to, right, to, to, to come out with in a marketing angle. The angle is to feel the protection of Hashem. That's it. Nothing else. How do you feel the protection of Hashem? You say, this land is ours because God gave it to us. That's why. That's what David Amalach says in Tehillim. It's Hashem told us the whole story of Bereshit. Why? To give us the inheritance of the nations. He's telling us, I created the world. Here's the whole story. And then there's me. And then there's Avram Yitzhak and Yaakov and all that. And then I gave you the land. The whole, the whole Bereshit is about Hashem giving us the land, right? So Hashem gave it to us. Stop telling the world that they're going to have compassion for us and sympathy and look we never have one Jewish country and look how big the Arab countries are and all that you know they paint the map and they show you look the Arab land look at the Jewish land they don't even know and whatever and you know what they do they say some of these official maps of the world they paint the map and they say ah Israel's so small anyway and the Arab land is so big let's just ignore and they ignore us and we're like oh, dare you I'm gonna oh, please you're trying to ask Asav to love you, but he hates you. Stop protecting the rest of your body. Hashem protects you. What do you need to protect? Your head. The head means a realization that this is from Hashem. And go to sleep. What does it mean go to sleep? It doesn't mean not to have weapons. You have weapons. You have a gun. You have soldiers. You have everything ready to go. I'm protected because I'm strong. If you're really strong, then you won't need to fight because they'll fall before you. They'll be petrified of you. How does it make sense? Well, the whole thing doesn't make sense. If you look what's going on in Eretz Yisrael, it makes no sense that we're still there and we still exist. We're surrounded by, on every angle. Yes, because Gadol Haro'e, there's a shepherd who looks after the sheep. And when you recognize that, that's when he protects us. The only thing blocking Hashem's protection is our lack of feeling his protection. So Hashem says to Yaakov, go to sleep. You're sleeping? You're relaxed? Okay. What I'm telling you is that if you stay that way, then I protect you. Now, notice one very important thing. Yaakov went to sleep because it was night. If you go to sleep by day, you know what that's called? If you can't wake up in the morning and you want to stay under the covers and not face the world, that's called depressed. That's not called sleeping. But if you go to sleep at night and you can't fall asleep because you're thinking about all your problems, what's that called? Anxious. So what you want to do is be able to sleep by night and do your thing and be awake by day. But when you're sleeping, you're resting. Calm. Serene. Hashem says to Yaakov, I got you. The whole land of Israel belongs to the Jewish people. You know why? It makes no sense. Because I said so. And I'm God. And if you accept that and you go to sleep, you'll have it. To sleep is very hard. Because I'm going to tell the Goy that this is my land. And he's going to say it's his and whatever. Keep on making the same mistake 
after the Six-Day War. They, they lost. Kick them out. No. Come back. Come back. Have your land. What? Your land. Hashem gave it. It's not your land to give away. It's Hashem's land and Hashem gave to the Jews. And what's going on now is, unfortunately, I mean, hopefully we'll get there. It's still good about the Jewish people. Hopefully the Jewish people are really mean at this time. I don't know what their plan is at the end, but Hashem's plan is that we get the whole thing. And if there's people out there right now that we can't kick out, okay, so you control and you stay strong. You know that the same thing applies in each one of us in our lives. Each one of us has daledamot. We have the, like the carved out, there's carved out of life, a sex section that each one of us is in charge of. Hashem gives you that. He says, yeah, that's yours. That's you. You control this piece of life. You know what that means? They say, right, whatever you need, you have. It's very easy in life to walk around and look at everybody else and say, oh, that person has money. I want that. That person has a great family. I want that. That one got all the shidochim in their family. I want that. And this one has such great kids. I want that. And that one has such a good brain. Wow, so brilliant. I want that. Such a good job. I want that. And the Shem's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. You can't have that. I'm Hashem. I'm going to give you what's meant for you. I'm going to give you your family. I'm going to give you your challenges. Yes, you'll have challenges. Yes, those other people you see who look perfect on Instagram, they all have their challenges. And this is what's for you. It's meant for you. Now he says, what are you dreaming of? What, are you, what do you want? What's your, what's your dream? What do you hope to achieve? Because built into our, our little four cubits that we have in life is dreams also. Take your dreams and ambitions and bring them in. What do you want? And you come up with what you want. And then you start realizing that you don't actually want that, right? What you want is the feeling that comes with it, right? Just thinking about the Rubashkin story. And like, what did he want? Well, maybe when he was growing up, he wanted, you know, I don't know, maybe he wanted to make a billion dollars. Do you think he wanted to be able to get the president of the United States when everything looked up to let him out of prison and, uh, you know, suddenly one day like that, then the whole world will rejoice with him is that something he could have imagined growing up would have happened to him? Right? It's not like you know, you don't know what you want. But isn't this, when you asked him in prison, you want a billion dollars or do you want that to happen? Right? You don't know what you want. You just know the feeling you want to get. And Hashem says, I'm going to give it to you because that's yours. So when you see someone else and you say, oh, I'm jealous of what they have. I wish I had that. I wish I had that. I wish, those are not real. Ask yourself the question, a real honest and genuine question at any point in time. What are your dreams? Those are the dreams. Those are the extra things you want. There's the four cubits you're sleeping on. And there's the rest of the land of Israel, which is your portion in the world. Every human being is put on this world to conquer something. What you're meant to get in life is yours. It's like, how do you get married? You take the shidduch that you want and you bring it here. How do you get over the challenges that you want by going to sleep? By relaxing. It's very hard to relax. Because when you want something, when something's wrong in your life and you need something to change, so you fret and you jump and you walk all over and you go crazy. And you want that to happen. And you're like, sometimes you, you're, you're feeling, why can't I have it? And you're feeling desperate. And it's so hard to feel desperate. What's Hashem telling you? Nope. Relax. Get into a space of absolute relaxation. But how am I going to get it? Hashem says, I'm going to fold over the whole land of Israel. That's your whole life and you, everything you want. I'm going to put it right under you. So what it means is, you don't get to control, right? And tell Hashem what you want. That's not the point. It's not to say, okay, Hashem, I want this million dollars. I want that I should find this and this spouse. I want that this and this person in my family should be normal. You don't get to choose that. Hashem chooses that. 
what you get to choose is looking at your life, what you want, and realizing what's the goal? What do you want to feel when you get that, right? And then you allow Hashem. He'll decide if it's a billion dollars or it's a getting the President of the United States to free you from prison. Whichever one Hashem wants it to be. It will be what you want. It'll be a good tov hanir eva nigle. It'll be a beautiful, revealed good. Relax into the position. That's what Hashem is telling you. Go to sleep. You know who went to sleep? Chizkiyahu HaMelech. King Chizkiyahu was surrounded by the 185,000 soldiers or battalions. There were millions of soldiers all around Yerushalayim. And that night, and they were looking at him and they were planning an absolute decimation of Yerushalayim. And all his ministers came and said to him, it's over, Chizkiyahu, there's no chance. And he says, no. You know what he did? The most impossible thing you could imagine. He said, Ani yashen al mitati. Laila tov. I'm going to sleep. Why are you going to sleep? Well, it wasn't day, it was night. Sleeping is the hardest thing. For anyone who has problems, sleeping is the hardest thing. Ask any teenager. You'll see that waking up in the morning is the hardest thing and going to sleep at night is the hardest thing. And you say, but do you like sleeping or not? So it depends. If I'm already sleeping, I want to stay there. If I'm awake, then I want to stay there. And what you want to do is go to sleep. Relax into this absolute space of like, it's all good. It's wonderful. Yaakov had to relax into that space and Hashem sends him such a powerful message. The whole land of Israel is right under you. It's all there. And then you discover something fascinating. Yaakov is going to a place called Haran. What does Haran mean? Haran means Haron. What's Haron Af? Anger. He's going to a place of anger. That's what Lavan is. It's a hard place to go to. He gets to Haran and he turns around and he says, I can't do this. Life is too tough. I can't do this. So he goes right back to his space. Go back to Hashem and let's talk to God. 14 years he was in Yeshiva. That was great. Then he goes out to Haran and it's too hard. Life is too tough. It's like, you know, sometimes you listen to the stuff and when we learn here and people come to me afterwards and like, it's great theory. I'm not sure how to actual, actualize it. Yeah, we're all in the same boat. I agree. It's hard, but it works. Because life is actually a comedy. Life is beautiful. It's an absolute pleasure and a delight. It's just fun. The whole thing's exciting. It's it's one big, exciting, fun, great um you know, experience. That's what it is. It's beautiful. The problem is when you're in the middle of it, it doesn't look so much fun. It actually is. Isn't it interesting how, what's the Hebrew word for rejoicing? Gila, rina, ditza, vachedva, right? Those are all the words. Rina. What's rina? Rejoicing. How do you spell rina? Resh, nun. Resh, nun, hey. How do you spell Haran? Reish. Mm-hmm. Same letters, right? Almost. What's the difference? Hey and Chet. What's the difference between the Hey and the Chet? They're the same letter. They look the same, right? The Hey and the Chet are exactly the same. What's the difference? The Chet has one opening. You Looks down. The Hey has a little opening on top. Your life is either haran, anger, or rina, happiness, delight. What does it depend on? Are you looking down? Or you have an opening on the side? That's the difference. If you train yourself to live life in a whole new level. See, most people live life and they look down. They're looking at what's happening, and they're reacting to what happens. If you react to what happens, your life becomes haran. Because this person just angered me. And so I'm responding in anger. You ever see people, when they argue, they play ping pong. 
like in a relationship. He sends that message, she responds. She sends back, you dare tell me that. Like, and it's like a ping pong game. That's because you're looking down. If you open up a little opening on the side, a little window, it suddenly switches from Haran to Rina. That's what's beautiful about it. How do you laugh? You know what you do when you laugh? Take the windpipe. The windpipe has this, it's like clogged up. Sometimes you've got, ha, 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 gone. You know? And when you laugh, it's like suddenly, like when someone has something stuck in their throat, one of the best things to do is to laugh. Laughter actually works. Because laughter is this air coming out in a very powerful way. It goes, and it comes out. And suddenly, ah, what do you have now? Now you have unclogged the pipe. When you are serious in life, it's tough. When you laugh and you just enjoy the ride, it's so much fun. The same exact scenario if you just get to laugh at yourself. Rina is the laughter. The excitement. How do you do it? You're feeling angry. Wow. You know how the kids say, like, if you ever have kids tell you, ooh, mommy's angry today. <laughs> right? And it just changes the whole, the whole uh, atmosphere. Do that to yourself. Say, whoa, I'm feeling angry. And you start laughing at yourself. Monitor all the time what you're feeling. Most people are stuck in their position where they are. So they play ping pong with other people and they get, you anger me, I anger you back. If you just pay attention to what you're feeling at that time, just notice it. Wow, I'm there. And you go right back to the space with Hashem. You'll see through the day you'll have myriads of feelings. One day, you, one moment you'll feel happy, the next you're excited, then you feel so insignificant, and then you feel so inadequate. And then you just feel cheeky and excited. And you just monitor the whole time from a bird's eye view what this little fellow called me is experiencing. It's interesting. We just, we're just very interesting people. And if you start monitoring it, you see how fun it is. Like, wow, look at them. They're getting moving that direction, that direction. Wow. That means stop being stuck in one position and looking down all the time. Open that little window. And if you open the window, the chet changes into a hay. And now, oh, now life becomes... Rina instead of Haran. And what happens is, as soon as you change your perspective and the head inside you changes, then you change things out there. It's a realization that Hashem is taking care of me. All I've got to do is just pay attention to how I'm feeling about it. <coughs> and then you go right back, Hashem is taking care of me. Because all those feelings are saying Hashem is not taking care of me. That's why it's interesting. There's a, there's a verse in, in Tehillim, Kapitel 68, Chapter 68, it says, Ge'ar chayat kane. Which literally means scream at the animal of the kanez, the reed. But another way to read it, ge'ar chayat. Chayat is spelled chet yud taf. Chet. Kane is? What's the kane? Kane and the veshet. The veshet is the esophagus. The kane is a trachea. The windpipe. When the windpipe is clogged, ge'ar chayat kane, scream at the chet of the blockage. Look at your life and say, the reason why I'm being blocked is because I have a chet. Because the chet means I'm looking down at everything. So, scream at the chet of the windpipe and say, hey, stop being a chet. You see, when Hashem creates the world, He's using the molecular structure of creation of the world. It's godly. Everything is Hashem. Hashem's creating the world. There's letters and He's saying the world into existence. Whatever's going on now is from Hashem. This moment that you're living in now is godly. Otherwise, it wouldn't be. And it's right from Hashem. So it's the wind of Hashem being blown down. But the wind of Hashem is being blocked. What's it being blocked by? My perception and my feelings. I said, but I want this to happen. Hashem said, God, I got the whole land of Israel under you. Everything is yours. But you have to do one thing for me. One thing. And that is relax. Go to sleep. And you're like, bup, 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 bup. that's the problem. That's the problem. And it's so counterintuitive. What are you saying to me? I should let's spell it out, right? When life is a mess and you don't know what to, what, you, what to do, and like you're going crazy over it, you're looking down. What you want to do is open up a little window to change it and start laughing at yourself. How do you do it? 
you realize whatever you have, you whatever you need, you have. Future, Hashem folds the whole land of Israel under Yaakov and he says, it's all yours. And then he says, okay, Yaakov says, now I can go to Haran. And Yaakov wakes up and he says, well, wow. I'm going to come back to my father's household. What's his father's name? Yitzchak. What's Yitzchak? The laughter. If I just start laughing at it, I'm going to come back in peace. If I just get excited about this journey, wow. it's going to be so, so fun. So yes, when life is the toughest, just notice one thing, how you feel about it. Stop trying to solve the problem. You can't. Just notice how you feel about the problem. And get calm and centered with Hashem. And then you wake up in the morning. And what does Yaakov do when he wakes up in the morning? No, he doesn't stay asleep. He goes to Haran. He faces all the challenges directly. And he faces Lavan. And he tells Lavan, I got this news for you, my friend. You're a, I'm a calm person. You're very intense. Achiv ani beramaut. Says the Rochel, go tell your dad. That if he wants to be a cheat, I'm good at it. I know how to do it also. You want to know why Lavan is called serenity? Because the darkest, most challenging, most tempestuous pieces of your life are all white. White is the sum total of all the colors. Everything that's going on is, in life is white. It's beautiful. It's serene. What's the problem? That Lavan himself doesn't live up to being a Lavan. The reason he doesn't is precisely because he knows this is Hashem, that's Hashem, that's Hashem, that's Hashem. It's all God. And so he wants to go face new issues and new problems to be able to discover Hashem everywhere. He doesn't know that. He just knows that he's very, very uncalm. Very stormy inside. Yaakov looks at him and he says, whoa, I can't handle this. This is too much for me. So he goes to Haran, leaves, comes back, goes to Haramoria, sets of Zava. What's the, that's what you're going to do every day. Every day you go to Davin. Davin is, when Esra, he turned to Hashem, he's like, I need this, I need that, I need that. I feel like I'm taking care of, I feel like I'm taking care of, I feel like I'm taking care of. Talk to Hashem every morning. Tell him what you need. You Davin. And then you sleep in it. And Hashem folds the whole land of Israel under you and he says, everything you need is there for you. All the feelings. And now you're ready to go to Haran, to go right into the absolute tension. Why? Because you know the truth now. You already slept about it. You realize the whole land of Israel is yours. Everything you want is yours. So Yaakov was able to walk in. He had nothing when he came in. He had zero money. He lost it all. He had no family. Okay, he had family, but the family was the problem. His uncle, instead of being being supportive, he was the whole challenge. And what happened to Yaakov? He walks in and he faces, okay, you want to change to this? Change. I'll, I'll, an Yizrom. What's an Yizrom? That means, I'm at the flow. I'm in a state of flow. I know. I already got it. Hashem has given me the whole thing. And so, whatever you do, yeah, I'm going to do that. Okay, yep, yep, yes. So he's holding his gun, you understand? He's there, ready for everything. But it's a calmness. What's the message here? Hashem creates the world, gave us everything. Hashem says, I'm behind you every step of the way. And life is just an absolute delight. If you're finding it difficult, you want to switch Haran to Rina. The way to switch it is by stopping to try to solve every problem in the book. Because you can't, and your life will be impossible. You just want to know what do you want? What's the land of Israel for you? What do you want? I just want to feel that my family is one. I want to feel the, the, the feeling of wholesomeness. Okay, do you ever feel it? Sometimes? Once in a blue moon? Focus on that. And then every time you have a negative feeling, let it out. Let the steam out. Not down under where you're screaming at the person. <sighs> What's going on here? You let it go. That's the hay. Open up a little window. And then you start getting centered every time. And then you do whatever you got to do next. 
Then Yaakov goes back to Haran. He says, okay, Lavan, I'm here. I'm ready. And what happens? This one big 20-year sojourn turns out to be the most beautiful life ever. The most, the, the most like intense time, tense, 20 years of tension. Seven years, he works for, for this, gets flipped over, another seven years, goes into the six-year presence. In the, in, in the middle of all this, what does Yaakov do? He produces 12 tribes, 11, 11 okay, 12, and then he goes and then he produces all the best, most incredible experiences you've ever imagined. All his children are amazing. He gets super wealthy. He gets everything. Why? Because he's not trying to get it. That's why. He went to sleep. He worked hard. You get it? He was working hard, doing what he's going to do. Messages. When things happen to you and they're tough, ask what you want. Talk to Hashem. Say, I want this. See how you'll feel when you get it. Start feeling that now. And whenever you don't, Allow the feeling to rise outside of you. Start laughing at yourself. And march forward into the next step you've got to do. What you'll discover is, and when we're plugged in, we can conquer the entire Haran and make it Rima in life.